So we are on week two of our series, God Leading, and we looked at the beginning of chapter 12 of Genesis last week and, and began the story of Abraham. And we talked a lot about our calling. If you remember, I showed a small, um, like three concentric circles, and right in the middle where all three of those circles joined is what Max O'Connor called our sweet spot, or what might be our calling. If, though, if you have weren't here last week, I invite you to go back to the website and, and listen to that message and, and take a look at some of those visuals we had in here. And so today, we're going to move from kind of our personal calling or, or even our, our larger calling as a church, and I want us to begin to talk about vision, because as I've talked to you um, the last few weeks, we've talked about how I really believe this is a year that our church is going to be doing some vision work and some goal setting. And so we need to think about how we get from this place here to this place that we want to go that is better than what we left behind. So I'm going to start today by filling you in on the rest of the story because, again, these stories are important. And I want to make sure people at least have some of the main points and understand some of these things. Now, as I go through this material, I want you to think about... Abraham or Abram's vision. What might you think he is going through as we tell the rest of this story? So last week we talked about him getting called out away from his family, away from his homeland and everything that he knows to go to this new place, this new land. And if he did that and did it obediently, then God would bless him. Okay? By the time we get to the end of chapter 12, we learn that there's now a famine in the land and that Abraham make, or Abram makes the decision to travel to Egypt. Okay? So think about that in terms of vision. You haven't even made it hardly six or seven verses in Scripture. And already the land, one of the promises that God has given to him, seems to fail. All right? The land can't support him, his livestock, his family. And so he has to go down to Egypt. What might one of us think if we did something similar in this modern age? What if, what if God says to Eric, you know what, I just need you to leave your home. I need you to leave all your family. I need you to move out to California because I've got this job in this new place that I think would be a great fit for you. So he goes and he does that. He's obedient. He takes the risk. He goes out there, gets settled in thinks, wow, this is pretty cool, you know, kind of starts to interact with the community, and pretty soon a letter comes in the mail that says the company he just moved out there to work for is downsizing, and now he's lost his job, okay? Think of how that affects the vision of Eric, how it affects the vision of Abram to come into this place where they really thought God was leading only to find challenge strike at the very first corner that they need. Now, oftentimes in, in some of the scholarship, people will, will say that Abram left out of fear, that maybe Abram didn't consult God in leaving, but I think that's a bit of a, of a stretch and a speculation because what do you do in a land that has famine? You're a shepherd. You've got lots and lots of sheep in your livelihood. What are you going to do if the land isn't supporting you and your family? You need to go someplace that you can continue to live. And so I think, you know, again, Abram probably made the best decision that he fought at the time for him and his family. Now, Abram does get a little bit crafty once he gets to Egypt, and he tries to deceive the Pharaoh. And here I would say, yes, there's obviously some fear because... He comes in and says, you know what, Sarah, I'm really kind of scared of Pharaoh. You're a beautiful woman. I'm afraid he might take you. And if, if he knows you're my husband, or he knows, oh, tongue. <laughs> <clears throat> and so he says, Sarah, if he knows that I am your husband, he might kill me and take my stuff. So just say that you're my sister. Now, in reality, Sarah really was a sister, so what he was saying was true, but to leave out the part that they were also husband and wife is kind of a tricky deal. So anyway, he goes in, he lies to Pharaoh, he gets a little bit in return because Pharaoh gives him a whole bunch of sheeps and uh, other things in return for Sarai, 
But then it's not long before God gets a little upset that Pharaoh has Sarai. And he basically stricken Pharaoh with a plague. And Pharaoh immediately comes to Abram and says, What have you done to me? Why didn't you just tell me the truth? Okay, and we have to think, you know, sometimes we think Pharaoh's not a very a very popular or strong person, but you have to remember to the ancient Egyptians, he's a deity. And so Abram's life hangs in the balance. You know, the snap of the fingers and Pharaoh could have Abram killed. And yet, in the midst of this, Pharaoh, again, what you might consider a secular ruler, a secular deity if you want, somehow knows that God is at work in what's going on. And he comes to Abram and says, you know what, you lied to me, I need you to get out of here and just go back home. And so basically, Abram gets humbled and he gets deported and kicked out of Egypt and has to go back to where he came from. Again, how do you think this affects his vision out of all this stuff that has happened. Oops. So let's talk about vision in terms of us, in terms of our churches. Now, Bill Hybels would define vision as a picture of the future that produces passion in the people. And basically what he would say is that it's taking people from here, finding a picture of the future, and moving them to here. And that this place should be more and better than the place that you left. King Solomon would say in either Ecclesiastes or Proverbs that if there is no vision, the people wander astray. And so vision for our churches is very important. Okay? We're going to have to do the work of figuring out where we are right here and right now and where we want to go to be over here. Now this summer, as I was praying about this and, and asking God to help me kind of discern the direction I thought we should go, God really gave me kind of this word picture for what I think possibilities could be like in our churches. And this is what he showed me. He showed me this pulsating light. And it started out very small. And as I was praying, I could see our church. And these lights began to form. And eventually, the light got brighter and brighter until I could no longer see the church anymore. And then it began to pulsate. You know, think of almost like a subwoofer or a speaker that just emits sound. Just boom, boom. And these pulses got stronger and stronger until these huge waves began emanating out of the church into the community and things were changed. As the pulses went through, it was like little glitters of that white and yellow light were just left on everything that they touched. And so this is the vision that I have for our church. And to be honest, I, I feel like I'm stepping out of place here a little bit because the vision can't be mine. Okay? The vision has to be you. It has to come from you. I share this with you because I believe that this shows the potential for what our churches can move into. And it's general enough to allow an infinite way for you to step into ministry and mission, but to give us perhaps a picture or a guideline of what that might look like along the way. But there are some real questions we have to ask ourselves in terms of our church. And that is, are we really willing to do the hard work to go from that little speck of light or to go from where we are right now, which is just what I would call probably a slightly growing church, to something that's over here? And folks, I think this church has a lot of potential to become that bright light, to become that pulsating light that goes out and shapes this community, that shapes this state, and ultimately shapes the nations if we will go there. But we have to decide if we're really going to do the hard work. That means we need leaders to rise up. That means we need people to step deeper into their calling to continue the ministries that they're doing or to start new ministries. It means that we need to go out and we need to be sharing the gospel message and bringing people in. 
Are we willing to do that? So think about that, if you will, as we return to our story. So Abram gets kicked out of Egypt, and he comes back to the land that God had led him to. And he comes back to a very familiar spot, a place between Bethel and I, the place that he had first built an altar in worship. And I think it's very fitting that after his kind of history of what's just happened, whether you think it's just normal decisions, whether you think Abram was a little off base in some of his decisions, maybe didn't consult God as well as he should have, then he comes back and says, you know what? The first thing I need to do is to worship. And folks, again, we talked about this last week, but worship is going to be paramount in us doing this vision setting and goal work. Why? Because it offers us many things. So the first question I ask you is, why do we worship? The answer should, for many of us, be pretty simple. We worship because of who God is. Think about, if you will, the glory and just sheer magnitude of this God, the creator of the universe, this infinitely all-knowing deity that is above everything, surrounds everything, has the ability to control and see all things, and yet desires to be in intimate relationship with each one of us. So we worship because of who God is, because God is a good God, because God is a God who keeps his promises. We also worship because that's what we were created to do. We were created to be in relationship with this awesome God. And what else can we do if we truly love and honor our God than to worship, to praise, to adore God? And what does worship do? Well, it lifts our eyes beyond ourselves. It keeps us focused and pointed in the direction that God wants us to go, or specifically on God himself. Now Max Lucado in his book, A Cure for the Common Life, talks about a time when he was out on a ship um, with some friends, and his friend said, hey, would you like to, you know, kind of captain and pilot the ship for a while? And he says, well, I'm, I've never done it before. And he's like, well, sure, I guess I would, but I don't know how. And he said, the guy said, you know what, just point the boat right at that cliff face over there, and everything is going to be fine. And he said, you know, when I was focused on the cliff face, everything was fine. The boat went straight. But pretty soon I got distracted. I saw my kids playing and having fun. I started looking out at the lake and all of the beauty of the scenery that I was, that was around me. And then pretty soon when I looked back, the boat had gone off course. And I had to steer it back in the right direction. And so again, worship removes the distractions. It, bring us, it brings us back to the things that are most important, the things that we need to focus on. Worship also humbles us. It's pretty hard to let the ego run high when we're praising an infinite creator, an infinite God. You know, I don't know how many times I've received compliments from you guys about oh, Josh, that was a great service, or that was a great message that really spoke to me, and I'm just like, it ain't me, guys. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the vessel. There's somebody working through me because I'm not that special of a guy. I'm not that talented of a leader or of a speaker. This is God. This is the Holy Spirit working through me. Because honestly, guys, some of the comp most compliments I've gotten have come from a day that I didn't think I did very good at all. And so I just go, praise God, because obviously you did something that I didn't think I did. Now the other thing, too, is that worship uplifts us. The Psalms are filled with stories and prayers and songs about times when people are brokenhearted, when they seem that they're at their, at their lowest point, when the world seems against them, and when they turn to praise and to worship, it lifts them out of that spot and again focuses them on the things of God. So folks, as we go through this year, let us be in worship all the time. And worship means more than just on a Sunday morning for an hour. It needs to permeate our days. 
Again, what does it look like to just spend time, again, doing simple things like praying over our meals and saying, God, thank you for the abundance that I have in my life. Thank you for this food. Thank you for the farmers that grew it and those that shipped it and all of the other things to get me this. Thank you that I was able to succeed at this thing. Or Lord, please help me because I'm really struggling here. I need your help. Uplift me. We need to be in worship constantly. Now again, as we continue our story, we find that perhaps Abram's vision might be shaken again because he no more gets back from this worship time and spends time when all of a sudden some conflict arises between he and Lot's herdsmen. Okay? And one of the things I'm going to say, folks, is that this work is hard work. Okay? To vision and goal set to really do and to do diligence for the things we need to do is going to require some hard work. And it's likely that we're going to run into some challenges and potentially some conflict along the way. Okay? We have many different ideas about how we should do stuff. We have different philosophies on how we should spend money, on how we should do ministry and mission. But I'm going to ask you, how will you respond if and when those things arise? Will you butt heads and want to be right and say, nope, this is the way we're going to do it? Or will we allow God to guide us, to be in compassion with each other and say, you know what? Well, let's think about this, or let's do this, or yes, we can do this, even though I don't care necessarily for that idea. How will we respond? I think we can, again, learn from Abram in this situation. Because he says, you know what? Let there be no quarreling between me and you, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are close relatives. It's not, it's not the whole land before you. So you know what, Lot? Just go separate from me. If you go left, then I'll go right. And if you go right, I'll go left. What a beautiful response to the conflict that arises. And so will that be our response? Will we respond in a loving and compassionate way? Or will we try to get our own way? Will we be stubborn? Will we let our egos get in the way? When it comes to money issues, will it determine our giving? Will we get stubborn saying, you know what, I'm not giving my money for that? Again, conflict can arise over all of this stuff, and we need to be careful as we walk through this. <coughs> now we're going to turn to Lot for just a minute, because Lot, again, is given the choice to take up some of the land, again, to choose to go left or right. And there's some interesting things in, in these verses because Lot looked, saw, and he chose. So he looks down and he, he basically picks what's probably the best part of the land that he can see. He looks down over the Jordan Valley and says, look, there's lots of water. There's some cities down there where I can get lots of supplies if I need. I think I'll just take this whole region for myself. And one of the things that I would like to draw your attention to is that Lot seems to only use his eyes alone. Okay? There seems to be no indication that he consulted God about what decision might be best for him and or for Abraham. So he basically just looks with his eyes, sees what he sees, and then chooses. The scripture even says that in many ways the Jordan looked like the garden of the Lord or looked like the garden of of Eden. And so there seems to me to be an element of greed here on Lot's part. Because what was one of the sins of the Garden of Eden? It was that Eve wanted more. Okay? And so Lot sees this beautiful land before him and wants more and takes it. Now in the future, in the next few weeks, we'll um, you know, look at perhaps some of the um, consequences of Lot's decision to do that. But keep that in your mind as we go forward. Now, I really want to draw your attention to these verses because these, I think, are some of the most exciting in this entire chapter. 
And it says, After Lot had departed, the Lord said to Abram, Look from the place where you stand, to the north, the south, the east, and the west. I will give all the land that you see to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants like dust of the earth, so that if anyone is able to count the dust of the earth, then your descendants also can be counted. Get up and walk through the land, for I will give it to you. And so, folks, again, think about Abram's vision. Think about twice this land has failed him, and yet God says, you know what? There's a promise here. There's a promise that I will give you this land. There's a promise that you will have offspring. Now, many of us that know the story of Abram know the conflict that arises when it comes to, to his offspring, right? We'll talk about that in future weeks as well. The other point that I would like us to think about is this idea of getting up and walking through the lane. All right? Now, I used to do this all of the time when I was in Eau Claire. And again, it, it, it suited me because I was not out in the country with you know a house every half a mile or something. But sometimes I would just get woken up in the middle of the night and I couldn't go back to sleep. And God would say, just go for a walk, go for a run. And what I would do is I would run through my neighborhood or around areas and I would just pray. Sometimes I would be called to just stop at a certain house or in front of a certain house and just pray. I didn't know who lived there, but just something said, you know what, I need you to stop and pray for this, for the people in this house, and I would do it. Other times I would just run and go sit on a bench by the river and, and just look at this. So folks, there's, there's real power in walking through the land that we inhabit, all right? What does it look like for us to do prayer walks through our community or prayer drives if you want? What does it look like to lift up things? Because you might be surprised what the Spirit illuminates for you as you drive through certain portions of this community or the state, whatever you decide. So last week we talked about promises in Scripture and about how there's amazing power filled um, that can come from, from claiming these promises. And I began to think this week, okay, as we step into this time of vision and goal setting, what does it look like for us to claim some of these promises? And as I prayed, this was one of the, one of the scriptures, one of the promises that came to me. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples, specifically Philip, and it says, Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified through the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Now personally this promise has always kind of scared me because I always kind of go, you know what, I don't think I've really manifested any of the miracles or any of the things that Jesus has done and yet he's saying that I'm going to do greater things than these. But folks, what happens if we truly claim this? If Christ really indwells in us, is this not possible? Is there not power in claiming this promise? Again, when I think about that pulsating light that comes out from here, what happens when we begin to manifest some of the miraculous power that Jesus did or do even greater things? Folks, this is possible, and I invite you to consider using this and perhaps other promises along the way to guide us in forming our vision and some of our goals. So I'll end with some points for you to pray, ponder, and have personal discussion. Um, the first is obviously to pray for our churches as we begin to vision. Pray that we would do the hard work of deciding where we want to go from here. I would ask that you pray for creativity, for boldness, for courage, for discernment. What promises is God asking us to walk into and claim this year? And again, this is kind of a trick question because the promises are always available to us. But are there perhaps some specific promises 
that we want to claim to lead us and guide us to start. Last week, if you were here, we talked about the seven mountains of culture um, and again how as people influence these mountains and the more mountains they influence, the more likelihood that they can change culture. I would invite you to think about again, what is our church's kingdom assignment? How are we to influence those pillars and influence our nation? I want to encourage you also to be intentional, to take some walks or some slow drives around our community. Be open when you do this. Pay attention and let God speak. Now, I really wish it wasn't, you know, 8 degrees and ugly out to do this event. It would be a lot nicer if it was like 70 degrees and sunny. But this is something that you can do throughout the whole year. And you might be just amazed at the transformation that you see as you pray here in January and you continue to walk around that block and see how it looks at the end of this coming year. And folks, continue to read the stories. Continue to read our story of Abram as we go through because I will not be able to highlight every single detail in the story as we go through the next few weeks. Um, but again, share that with your friends and with your children. As we end our message time, um, I do just want to make one quick announcement, and that is that um, next week we're going to have a, a guest speaker. Um, Jenna Call is coming back to come and speak with us about some of the work and missionary work that um, she has done. She was here uh, a while ago, and I believe some of you are supporting her. Um, just to give you an update, she raised all of the money she needed to be able to go on some of her mission trips, and um, she'll be coming to kind of speak about some of the opportunities she had and just the life-changing uh, experiences that she had as people came and accepted Christ in some of the countries um, that she was at. So please hope that, uh, that you can make that. It should be um, an awesome time to hear some of the stories she has to share with us. Um, at this time, let us move.